In this episode, we're taking a look at the deepest image ever taken of the entire X-ray sky. Stick around and we're gonna get to the bone of the issue. This is a picture in a thousand words. Welcome to A Picture in a Thousand Words. My name is Mobi Rahman, and we're gonna jump right in to this incredible kaleidoscope of X-ray colors that was taken by the Erosita Space Telescope. So let's jump right in. So this is an image taken by the Ebrozita Space Telescope. It's a German and Russian space telescope that has been running since 2019. And its entire goal has been looking at X-rays coming from all across the sky. And it's designed to cover large areas of the sky. This is an image that has taken 182 days to put together. And it's been capturing images all along those 182 days. This can only really be done from space because our atmosphere blocks a lot of the x-rays from hitting the surface of the Earth, which is a good thing because that wouldn't be great for human life or any other kind of plant or animal life in general. So let's take a look at the image itself. And it's impressive to think that this is all 360 degrees of the sky. And it's a little hard to really conceive. Astronomers take a look at these kinds of maps regularly, so let's dive a little bit into how we take a 3D object like the sky and put it into two dimensions. So the easiest way to think about it is thinking about a map of the world or the globe. The globe is a three-dimensional object, but we generally look at maps in two dimensions. And the way that we do this is by projecting the map or looking at a projection of the globe into a two-dimensional map. And every time you do this, it's kind of imperfect. Every projection, every way that you could potentially turn a 3D globe into a 2D map makes some compromises. And so we try to choose the best compromises that we can. So imagine, so this is your two-dimensional or your three-dimensional globe over here. And notice that everything on it is essentially a circle, that the edge over here is a circle but we can transform everything here and put it on a two-dimensional map so we see everything. And so this edge over here would go something like this in the projection that we're gonna be looking at. This edge over here would go over here in the projection that we're looking at. And it's important to note that, you know, the North and the South Poles on our Earth are just points. If, you know, in some map projections, you see them as a line on the top and a line on the bottom. But in this kind of projection, they are just also points. And that's one of the reasons that we use this particular kind of projection. And as you can see, we know that there's less area around the North and the South Pole. And the equator is the longest line in the east-west direction. And so the size of this image reflects how much area there is. And that's something that's useful when we want to take a look at a map of the entire sky, because we want to make sure that the area that we're seeing is probably similar to the area that is actually in the three-dimensional globe. Now, the, there are a couple of differences when it comes to taking a look at a sky map, which is a projection versus a map of the Earth. So the first one is obvious. When we're looking at a map of the Earth, we are looking down on the Earth versus when we're looking at the sky, we're going upwards and we're looking outward. So think out versus in. It's just a bit of a reverse. The second thing that isn't as obvious is when we're looking at the Earth, we're only seeing the top layer of it. Everything is roughly, with the exceptions of, you know, mountains and some of the canyons, roughly at the same height. Whereas when we're taking a look at the sky, we're looking at everything that goes from here all the way to the edge of the observable universe. All of that is on our map in our projection. So whereas we know the distance to everything on the Earth because it's just at essentially the surface layer, it's much harder to do with a sky map. And so we're seeing everything all at once and it can get confusing at times. And so trying to figure out what the distance of things is important. But let's go back to the X-ray map. 
So this image took 182 days to capture this entire thing. In doing so, we were capturing 400 million points of light, 400 million photons. So that sounds impressive. But when you look at the full moon with your own eyes in the visible light, you're getting roughly a few billion photons every second. Suddenly 400 million points of light over 182 days doesn't actually sound like that much in comparison. Why is this? Why do we get so much more, so many more photons in our eyes from just looking at a full moon, which isn't even the brightest thing that we look at on a daily basis, versus the x-rays, which take forever to even get a couple? And the answer is the color of x-rays. So x-rays are light that's much, much bluer than blue. It's much, much bluer than ultraviolet light. They have, for every single photon or particle of light, they've got a lot more energy. So whereas, you know, around the visible light, the comparison between that and X-rays is it'll be a thousand to 10,000 times more energy in every photon of light. So if you're looking at things that are producing roughly the same amount of energy, you'll have fewer X-rays being produced from that same thing as you would get from, say, optical light and even more from, say, infrared light, or even as you go all the way down to as red as you can get to radio waves, all of those things will produce more photons. And the bluer the light is, the more energetic your photons are, the more energetic the light is, the fewer you're going to get for the same amount of energy. So when we look at the image, what the astronomers have done is they've taken the different energies of the photons of light, the different energies of the x-rays, put them into three different groups based on the amount of energy and assign them colors. So the red here are the reddest or the least energetic of the photons of the x-rays. And so that's why this is all being colored red. The green, on the other hand, these are sort of the medium in between energetic x-rays. And the blue, well, those are the bluest or the most energetic x-rays. And one of the things to note is they could have put these cuts anywhere. There's not really a specific reason other than convention for them to have put cuts in specific places. But let's dig into what this is actually showing us and go on a bit of an x-ray treasure hunt. So the most prominent thing that you're probably going to see is this over here. This really bright thing. And remember, because you're looking at an all-sky map, it looks like a big arc on this on this image. But in reality, this would be in real life just kind of going all over the place. And the second thing to remember is because we're looking at things that are both close and things that are far away, you would think that things that are close would look bigger to you. So this is one of the most close features, even though it's a bit of a mystery how far it truly is. And what this is, is it's called the, the North Polar Spur. And so what this is, is likely gas that has been heated up from a supernova explosion. So the death of a star that turned into one of the brightest explosions that we see in the universe on a regular basis would heat that up and get it so hot that it's producing x-rays in this gas. And that's why we see it as a big arc. It's probably something that happened relatively nearby and all that gas is kind of strewn around us. And this particular object, even though it's very, very big on the sky, we actually don't fully understand it. One of the big things is we don't know its precise distance. And so this is something that astronomers are actively working on trying to figure out. So the next thing that is really prominent is this red haze that seems to be essentially everywhere, which would indicate that this red haze is kind of all around us. So what this red haze is, is essentially what's called our local bubble. So this is hot grass that's around our solar system. It's within about a hundred light years or a couple hundred light years of us. And this is by what we think is a local supernova that went off. Again, an explosion of a dead star or a star dying uh, that happened anywhere from between 10 to 20 million years ago. And so it heated up, it exploded, all that energy went into heating up the gas around it. And that gas is now producing all 
of these x-rays as it cools down. And again, this happened anywhere between 10 to 20 million years ago. And so it's just taking a long time for all that gas to cool down. Gas takes a long time to cool down when it's in the middle of space. So the way that we've oriented this map is we've put the disk of the galaxy right in the center. So we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and it looks like a disk. And we are in that disk. So if we were in that disk, when we'd look around, the galaxy would look like a straight line. And that is what you're seeing essentially on the equator of this map, is that is where the plane of the galaxy lies. So we know that our galaxy is filled with large amounts of gas and large amounts of dust. And that dust and gas are mixed together and they block a lot of light that's coming through. And that's no different for x-rays. That all of what we're seeing here are basically the silhouettes of gas clouds that are located in the disk of our Milky Way. And that's what we're checking out over here. So what we're seeing is areas where the x-rays can't get through. And that blocked x-ray is turning out to look like black. But the next thing we're seeing, if you look carefully, is you're seeing little bits of blue right in the center. So as we look right in the center of this image, that is towards the center of our galaxy. And what there's going to be a lot more stuff there and a lot more things that are producing x-rays. But one of the cool things about x-rays and the way that they interact with gas is the more energetic the x-ray, the more likely it is to be able to penetrate that gas. And in this image, the most energetic of x-rays are colored blue. So that's why this looks like blue, because all of the uh, medium energy and low energy x-rays can't make it through that gas, but the highest one, the bluest ones can. But if you look further up, so if you kind of look off the plane of our galaxy, there's less da dust and less gas that you're gonna have to go through. So there's a point where all of the green stuff, all of this green stuff starts to be able to get through. You still don't see a lot of red, but you get the greens and you get a little bit of blue. And that is what's happening there. It's essentially the dust and the gas are filtering the X-ray light based on its color. So now that's that sorted, those are the biggest things that we see. And we can also even see little bits of supernova explosions that have gone off. And it's a really, the X-ray is really great to be able to pick out these young supernovas and the really hot gas that comes after their explosion. The next thing that we're seeing are all of these little spots of little white light. And that means they have comparable amounts of red, green, and blue x-rays coming towards us. And they seem to be coming from all over the place. It doesn't seem to be one specific direction on sky. And what's happening there are we're seeing galaxies that are much, much beyond our own galaxy. And they're in every single direction because one of the cool things is as you get further and further away from our own galaxy, the universe seems to look the same in most directions that we're looking at. And so there will be just as many galaxies up here as there are over here, as there are over here. So these spots will be in every single place. But what's shining in the X-ray? Well, that's where it gets really cool or actually really hot because these are supermassive black holes. And these supermassive black holes, they are having large amounts of matter falling onto them. And as it falls onto them, it gets heated up really hot to millions of degrees, and it shines out these bright lights. And that are, those are the points of lights that we're seeing through this image. These are able to pick out what are known as active galactic nuclei because they're generally in the center of the galaxy, hence nuclei, and they're active because there is a lot of gas that are falling into them right now. And so we're seeing them all over the place and we can pick them out in the X-ray very easily. Our own galaxy has a central supermassive black hole as well, but there's actually not that much gas falling into it at the moment. That's why our galaxy doesn't have one of these active galactic nuclei. It just has a standard galactic nuclei. I don't think we really call it that, but 
you get the idea. So the last thing that I'm going to point out are these little fuzz balls that you see over here. There's a few of them, and if you stare more carefully, you can find more of them. And they're really interesting. So what these are are big clusters of galaxies, or galaxy clusters, and they are groups of thousands of galaxies that are all together in a very small region. Just to give you a sense, some of these will have, this one is the Virgo galaxy cluster, and this one has thousands of galaxies in the same distance between us and our largest, closest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, about a million light years away. And so all of these galaxies, if you imagine that there was a galaxy like this and a galaxy like this and a galaxy like this and another one that might just kind of look like a blob and they're all whizzing around one another, flying all over the place. And as they're doing that, they're pulling gas out from one another and all that gas is heating up. And that gas gets to around 30 million degrees Celsius. And we're seeing that hot gas. Because it's so hot, it's producing x-rays. And we can see them over here. And the cool thing is, based on the temperature of the gas and how many x-rays we're seeing, we can basically tell how big that galaxy cluster really is. It's a really cool property of galaxy clusters uh, to be able to figure out how, man, how much of stuff there is, being galaxies or gas, based on what the temperature it is. So as you can see, the X-ray sky has a lot of different phenomena, everything from hot gas from ancient supernova that are really close to us, or that went off really close to us, to supermassive black holes and galaxies that are much more distant, all the way to tightly packed clusters of galaxies. The X-ray sky gives us a different lens in which to take a look at the sky and the universe as a whole, and with that, help us try to understand what's going on. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of A Picture in a Thousand Words. If you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. We just want to get some feedback so that we can improve our next episodes. And feel free to leave a comment in the box below, especially if you have a recommendation of an image that you want us to take a look at. And if you did like us, please feel free to share us or subscribe to our socials and definitely let your friends know about A Picture in a Thousand Words. The fun fact that we have for you today is that while most of the things that you see with your own eyes come in hundreds, thousands, or even millions of photons every second, your eyes are incredibly sensitive. Scientists have done work showing that your eyes have the ability to see something as faint as a single photon. That's really impressive and something to think about the next time you're in a place that's pitch black. Until next time.